is going to try and locate the octopus and pose him for the camera. The ocean floor is a dream world, silent, vast, mystic, unreal, lonely beyond words, beauty that haunts one, majesty all its own, inhabited by strange, weird creatures like this great sea anemone, so named because it looks like the wind flower. You've seen little ones on the rocks at low tide. Long tentacles like the petals of a lovely flower. But when touched, they close up into a compact ball. Like the giant ray, it lives by scooping in its prey and sucking it to pieces. Now watch how quickly the fish that our boys throw down is enclosed in that living sepulcher. You know, this diver's rig isn't the easiest thing in the world to handle. Moving isn't hard, but progress is retarded, like a slow motion picture, because of the water resistance. In this submerged world, queer, unreal lights play across the ocean floor. Strange fish peer out of unexpected corners. Forests of gently undulating seaweed. Gaudy shells, which at the touch of the diver's foot become animate and scuttle away. The camera can look so much farther afield. Merciful powers, what's this eerie shape? There it is. Look out, octopus! The crawling, irresistible, slimy, death-dealing monster of the seafloor. And he's behind the diver. There's no phone in his helmet. His pal to warn him. What a chance he takes. Good, good man, make him see! Oh, strange indeed are the wonders of the... Eight great, immensely powerful arms, each with its two rows of deathly suckers. Ooh, look out! That slithering death is right on you! He'll crush your bones into jelly! Look out, boy! Look out! Quick, now, quick! The helmet and boots are too heavy. Get out of them! Get out of there! Oh, thank goodness. Oh, well, let's call this fellow names, too. He deserves to be sworn at. You old cephalopod, that's you. Octopus punked at us. Accent on the punk. Say, that was a close call. Three days out from Acapulco. Dragged offshore by a good tug, refitted, restocked, everybody happy and raring to go. The only thing that couldn't be replaced was the diver's rig. That's probably decorating the parlor of some mermaid by now. Hello, there's something that looks interesting. Uh, interesting, I should say it is, big news. What the newspaper man would call a whale of a story. This is a real whale, 120 feet long. Whales are strange creatures, mammals, originally land animals. There she blows. They're warm-blooded, breathing air by lungs, having babies, not eggs, and nursing them with milk. Their greatest enemy is the swordfish, a monster mackerel. And there goes one now. Straight for the whale's vulnerable belly, he goes. Through ages of poking into other people's business, this fellow's nose has lengthened out until in big fish it attains a length of five or six feet sharp enough to drive straight through the side of a small boat. What a schnoz, what a schnoz. This swordfish is without doubt the gamest fish that swims the ocean. He goes after whales like a terrier after a bull. It's instinct, of course. 
Often a swordfish will charge a ship and drive his snout into the planking until it breaks short off. Imagine what it must do to a fish, even one with so tough a hide as the whale. What a fight, what a fight! The swordfish has all the advantage of quicker turning, sharper weapons. The whale's only defense is his mighty tail. One clean blow with that two-ton sledge, and even this terrific stabber would be put out of commission. But the swordfish rolled with a punch. Now they spar for a moment at long range. Then back goes the old stabber. Caesar, good, what a battle. Threw him clean out of the ocean. Friends, no one has ever been lucky enough to photograph any such fight as this before. But the race is not always to the swift, nor is the battle always to the strong. Remember David and Goliath. Oh, this is terrible. Leviathan in range. Dangerously wounded. Well, there can be only one end to this fight. Our boys decide to put the gallant old monster out of his misery. For this attack might go on for days. Remember this whale weighs not less than 120 tons. There's a lot of him to die. This is risky work. It takes nerve to go in under those terrifically slapping tails and put a harpoon into the poor old beaten monster. But they're going to do it. Take the human touch, combine it with a digital computer, and you've got composer-producer Giorgio Moroder. Plugged in, turned on, and creating musical magic from thin air and solid-state electronics. From his disco hits for Donna Summer to his Academy Award for the score of Midnight Express, Marauder's an innovator, performing in his favorite place, a cluttered studio. I don't like to perform live. I toured uh, part of Europe uh, about seven, eight years ago when I had a hit there. And every night it was a little nightmare, so I decided not to do it. Oh, okay, there we go. The, the melody? Channel two. The end result of Moroder's Take computer the, composing the a is a new record album, appropriately called E equals MC squared. Aside from a drummer, the sound is strictly Moogs, Memory Banks, and Marauder. Okay, I think it's, it's, it sounds okay. Okay, now I'm going to use the vocoder to add a kind of a flavor to my voice. There are two components. One is the voice, the other one is the synthesizer, and the, com the vocoder mixes both things together. For example, if I would play this two notes, you wouldn't hear anything, but if I talk in the mic, you would hear one, two, three, four, five. I could have a kind of a computer voice or an old uh, 60 song. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to do For example, Baby Blue, the song uh, I just did is. In the flowers, tantalize, I spend them waiting for the time when suddenly you be back home again. Baby blue, baby blue. Giorgio Morona. If there's a limit to computerized electronic music, he hasn't found it yet. But he's looking and looking in places where only his special kind of imagination can take it. Reporting from a recording studio that even NASA can't match, I'm Chuck Ashman. You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams. Onion in blue baggots. Five pence pieces. Somebody tell them that it's green for cheese and onion. People who stop dead right in front of you when you're walking along. Lies. The rush hour. Nil, nil, I mean. This position is now closed. That person at the five items or less checkout. Oh, the wrong rental video in the box. He's got six, look, there's six of them. He's got six items. Forget all the niggles. In fact, forget that number. Right, what's next? Man has 
described himself in many ways. But if we concentrate on man in relation to his control over his environment, no description is more apt than the description of man as a tool-making animal. And in the short history of mankind, the majority of the tools which man has made can be thought of as an extension of his muscle power. That is, the ability to perform work faster and in greater quantity. However, in the mid-1940s of the 20th century, a different kind of tool was invented. A tool for extending certain of the powers of man's mind. This tool is the electronic computer. It is the fast, reliable, and tireless performance of a variety of arithmetic and logical operations that gives the computer its great utility and power. But merely looking at a computer won't tell us very much about what it actually is doing. Neither will this tell us anything about the revolutionary material and intellectual effects of such machines. We can easily see the material and intellectual effects of, say, machines for transportation. We know that the modern jet aircraft represents a great increase in speed over the earliest aircraft. We also know that modern airplanes have made the world smaller and changed our way of thinking about ourselves and our world. And future means of transportation will bring even more rapid and radical changes. But even the difference between the speed of an ox cart and the fastest rocket is small when compared with the difference in speed between calculation by hand and calculation by computer. For example, the first electronic calculator to be completed could do the work of 50,000 people working by hand. Scientists, when they speak of a great change in speed or size, prefer to speak in terms of a unit of measurement called an order of magnitude meaning 10 times as much. Dr. Richard Hamming, a research mathematician for the Bell Telephone Laboratories, in a paper presented before a meeting of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science, put it this way. The computer revolution is often compared with the famous industrial revolution in importance and scope. The industrial revolution effectively freed man from being a beast of burden. The computer revolution will similarly free him from dull, repetitive routine. The computer revolution is, however, perhaps better compared with the Copernican or the Darwinian revolution, both of which greatly changed man's idea of himself and the world in which he lives. Before getting into the main part of this paper, it is necessary to discuss briefly the idea of a change in a technology. Change is often measured in units of an order of magnitude, meaning roughly a factor of 10, 10 times as much. It is a common observation the change of an order of magnitude in technology produces fundamentally new effects. As an illustration, consider the following example. Modern jet planes are about one order of magnitude faster than Wright Brothers' first plane. Another example, the fastest missiles are somewhat more than two orders of magnitude faster, meaning about three to 300 times faster. Automobiles are used at speeds around one order of magnitude faster than a horse and wagon. Each of these have produced whole new effects. Indeed, it is said that the automobile has produced even a change in our morals. Computers have improved in speed by at least six orders of magnitude, a million-fold. In order to understand the factor of a million, consider the following two situations. First, that you have only one dollar, and second, that you have a million dollars. You can readily see that in the two situations, there are fundamentally different effects. You adopt a different view of yourself and the world in which you live. Along with the change in speed, there has been a great increase in reliability, so we now do much longer computations than were practical by hand. Finally, 
with the increase in speed, there has been a corresponding decrease in the cost. Something more than 1,000 times cheaper. It is as if suddenly automobiles cost two to four dollars, houses 20 to 60 dollars. And the changes in the computer technology are still going on. These then are the... We hardly need to be reminded that we live in a world that is becoming more complicated and more crammed with information every day. One description for this vast quantity of data on everything from the lifetime earning records of an individual to the beeps and pulses relayed to Earth from a space satellite uses that overworked word, explosion. This time, an information explosion. The computer is an invaluable tool for processing these millions of bits of information in accurate, fast, and economical fashion, in accordance with rules and instructions provided by the human programmer. In the most gigantic of all record-keeping jobs, the social security system, more than one million personal records can be processed in one day. This manufacturing plant is entirely computer-controlled in accordance with rules for decision-making stored in the machine's memory. This chemical plant for making polyisoprene was designed by a computer. In a recent example, a computer in 16 hours and out of 16,000 possible designs selected the design that most closely approached the ideal design as defined by the engineers. In this actual firing of the multi-million dollar Saturn rocket was simulated on this computer many times before the actual firing was authorized. And these simulated firings, which helped eliminate many of the problems in the functioning of the rocket, cost only a fraction of what an actual launching would have cost. Each of these operations, record keeping and accounting, control, design, and simulation, is achieved through the manipulation of numbers according to instructions and rules given to the computer by the programmer. But what are these rules? And what is the relationship between numbers and the real things they are said to represent? These are some of the questions that we put to the scientist, and we've already seen, Dr. Richard Hamming, research mathematician at the Bell Telephone Laboratories. Well, I would say that at present at the Bell Telephone Laboratories, we do about 10% of the experiments on a computer and about 90% in the laboratory. I would expect that in time we will do 90% on the computer and 10% in the lab. Speed, cost, and effort favor the computer over the laboratory approach. This advantage is possible because we construct a mathematical model rather than a material model. I use the word construct because the mathematical equations are the construction rather than a materialistic physical model. It is perhaps fortunate we have found, particularly in the field of physical sciences, that our predictions based upon the mathematical models agree very well with what we observe in the physical world. The 19th century physicist Heinrich Hertz described the concept of a model in these words. We make for ourselves internal pictures or symbols of external objects. And we make them of such a kind that the necessary consequences in thought of the internal pictures are always pictures of the necessary consequences in nature of the object symbolized. The idea of a mathematical model is fairly easy to understand. A very simple, trivial example is the numbers you calculate on your check stubs. You combine various numbers by addition and subtraction, and they correspond in a very real sense to the amount of money that you have in the bank. The mathematical model is the numbers you manipulate, the amount of money you actually have in the bank is the physical world. Let us consider now a slightly more complex example. This is a common experience for most of us. The front end of the car dips sharply when we come to a sudden stop. In technical language, there is a transfer of weight from rear to front in the action of braking. A mathematical model of this transfer of weight can reveal exactly how much weight is on both wheels. And different road surfaces and braking conditions will result in different weight distributions. But the mathematical model for the transfer of weight from rear to front will remain the same. In this mathematical model of behavior of an automobile, 
we can use a computer to simulate what would happen in actual practice. We have actually found that our mathematical models of automobile traffic predict very well many of the effects which we observe. Returning to our more general remarks about the use of computers, we first used computers to simulate situations in engineering, situations which we had been doing before by hand. The computers allowed us to do much larger and more complex problems. But this ignored the order of magnitude effect which we spoke of. We are now beginning to use the machines in entirely new ways on entirely different problems. And this is the exciting part. This is the intellectual aspect of applying the machines to completely new ideas that has so excited many people in the field. One of the uh, characteristics of human beings is uh, uh, that among other things that they do is that they solve problems. And what it means, of course, to solve a problem is uh, being able to not only get an answer to uh, a question that arises in a particular situation, but then uh, to find other cases that are similar to the initial one, so that we are, in effect, in a position to solve not just one concrete problem, but a whole class of them. This is well, Professor example, Ernest Nagel, uh, the leading logician and philosopher when, uh, from Columbia uh, University. Once a domain has been developed to the point where uh, answers can be uh, given from given set of assumptions uh, simply by following uh, some uh, set of instructions or uh, some rules, then it's not entirely evident that one should be thinking of the significance of every step that one is performing. Well, is it also possible to instruct machines to follow the rules of thought? Indeed, I think this is, of course, uh, the basis for having uh, machines or computers, uh, since their uh, entire task consists in following a set of rules or programs uh, so that uh, in a very uh, short uh, span of time uh, they're able to come out with an answer uh, that would have taken uh, human beings an extraordinary length of time to produce. It seems to me that the computers, because they enable us to ask new questions, also enable us to get entirely new answers. They do not answer all the old questions, but because the questions are new, the answers are also new and very exciting. There is a strong tendency to speak of the machine as solving the problem, when in fact, really it is the program which describes to the machine what the machine is to do. This is overlooked, and I think a great deal of confusion arises from this. It is not that we do not have adequate machines to solve our problems many times, but rather we lack adequate descriptions of how to solve the problem. This is a very important point to understand. As we spread out and learn more and more about our techniques of solving problems, we will be able to do wire and wire class of problems. It is not the machine so much as it is our lack of ideas that controls. You're watching Sleep Core, Media for Insomnia. Hello and welcome to Thames Reports. We focus first tonight on the acid house craze. If you read the popular press or listen to the politicians, your mind is probably made up already. These parties are said to be linked with drug taking or worse. They're in breach of local authority licensing regulations and besides, they keep the home counties awake at night. But is that the whole truth? Don't young people who want to party have rights as well? And if it's young people prevented from doing their thing today, couldn't it be the rest of us tomorrow? As police pressure to stamp out the acid house craze intensifies, Marcus Powell and a Thames Reports team spent Saturday night on the party trail. Sunday morning, 1 a.m., hundreds of party seekers are stopped by a police roadblock for fleet services on the M3. Police action had blocked the route to another secret, unofficial party. Would-be ravers were going nowhere. Residents of Hampshire say no, no, Hampshire Constabulary, we don't want these people having parties in our area disturbed all weekend. So 
So I'm in that difficult situation of sorting out whether you should go on, because the Acid House Party is an unlawful type party, why is that? Why you have to yeah, but, uh, Because you have to have clarification yeah, from the local authorities. Yeah, but you lot don't really yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, I've been going, I tell you, I've been going every week for two years now. I guarantee I'm one every week. I'm not just saying that, I do. Uh, so I've never seen any violence started by any of these youngsters here no who just want to no dance. Way. If there's ever any violence started, it's them. started by them. 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 And you'll all agree with me, won't you? Yeah! Yeah! yeah. The people dance! Let them go! The people dance! Hours later, a few hundred ravers dip into punk. Outside, another confrontation. Party organisers are now employing lawyers to try to defend their rights. Well, they have no permission to be in this building. Well, I've seen a signed lease. Well, this is the builder of the premises. He hasn't even signed over the premises to anybody. Well, I have... It's still under, it's still under construction. Well, let's not... Uh, the impression that my clients were given and they certainly paid an amount of money to rent this building and they've got a lease signed by who they say is the owner. And who do they say is the owner? Well, I haven't got the documents, so I'll go back and come back with them. If you do so, please. So, and your name is? The party craze is surrounded by legal uncertainty. Do people have a right to party? Do they need a license? Do ravers have the right to travel there? But even with legal help, there's no guarantee of success. While some party goers are held behind police lines, the arguments go on. Here, the disputes over the validity of the organiser's lease. Signed, sealed and delivered. The police were still not convinced. Solicitor John Wadham later found himself arrested on suspicion of burglary and criminal damage. This is the term. He was subsequently released. Meanwhile, other ravers barricaded themselves inside using a truck. The government intends to strengthen its own defences against parties, proposing prison for organisers, confiscating assets and tougher penalties for breaking public order and noise control. More powers for the police. Because of pressure from politicians, the press and public, the police have now logged details of over a thousand party helpers on computer at a special intelligence What's unit in Grey's End. Uh, 19 so far, sir. I mean, that's the last that we have. They're yeah, keeping so tabs on party organisers throughout all London all and the South East. He says that his location is going to be in an area where the sound won't affect people, but go upwards. It's from here they're coordinating the crackdown. John Gillis from the East They admit they're up against an informal army with a communications network which matches their own. It may even be better. I'm just wondering if there's any spinning optics at all. Not all of them, yeah. Only the ones that we've been approached for. Those that we can definitely link in with being concerned with acid health parties that we're actually looking at. As this war hots up, only half the parties organised ever take place. At one party which was stopped by Essex police, guns were found, confirming their suspicions that organised crime is already heavily involved. We've got some very sinister undertones now. We've got uh, crime involved, drug taking, alcohol taking, major crime organisers muscling in on the profits. They have to be controlled. They, there's, there's going to be a disaster sooner or later. Somebody's going to get killed, if not a number of people. If we ignore the signs, then I think we'd, we'd be very, very unwise. The lighting arrived yet? Lasers? Yeah, OK. Promoters carry on regardless. Um, I should be with you in about half an hour. Uh, the meeting point will sort out, yeah. Patrick Prendergast is still trying to keep a step ahead of the police. Behind him and all the other fashionable frontmen, there are financial backers with more muscle than morals. Now he's off to record a commercial to advertise another party. Hello, Ravers. Sorry about Saturday, but we were stopped by the police without injunctions and unnecessary force. We're going again this weekend. Power to the Ravers. Search of Space 89. In this shadowy world, beyond the law, pirate radio stations are the only ones to play the music and advertise the raves. We're doing it on the acid house scene. We're going to go for a quick ad break. We will be back on the other side.
This is the information source for party goers, where phone numbers for meeting points are given out. Party organisers like these know that this big tax-free business is under increasing threat from police action. A party which could raise a million pounds was planned this weekend, although it failed to take place. The risks are as high as the rewards. They're supposed to have injunctions to shut us down. They had nothing, absolutely nothing. They come straight in there. As soon as they knew what to do, they said, right, you're, so you're closed down. We've what started out as a mere game, cops and robbers between police and promoters, has now turned pretty nasty. You're watching Sleepcore. Sleep tight. that tours the highways and byways of America, bringing a thrill-packed show to hundreds of thousands of spectators all over the country throughout the year. Day after day, night after night, the equipment is unloaded for the grueling series of breathtaking routines that a talented troupe of daring drivers perform with the same fleet of regular production model cars. Yes, this is the outfit, and this is the slogan they swear and live by. I drove all three. Comparison proves it's Chevrolet for me. And here's a man who should know. I'm Joey Chitwood. I'm the boss of this outfit, so be my guest. Join the crowd that's come to take in the exciting thrill-a-minute show that my boys and I put on. Popcorn, peanuts, and red hots for the customer, and a real hot car for the drivers. Chevrolet is the only one we use not a souped-up reinforced model, but the same Chevrolet you'll find on any showroom floor. The hundreds of thousands of people who catch our show in a season see with their own eyes that the cars they can buy are the same ones we drive. And I'm giving it to you straight. My boys and I give hundreds of performances, day and night, with this same fleet of Chevrolets. And when you see the pounding we give them in these highlights from various shows, you get an idea of why the car we use has to be able to take it. And now here's our announcer getting the show underway. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome in behalf of Joey Chitwood and his world champion Auto Thrill Show. And now moving along with the individual introduction of each of the Daredevil stars driving brand new 1956 Chevrolet cars. Directly That's how we take our bows. Just the drivers, mind you, not the Chevrolet. We can spin on a dime and give you a nickel change. Believe me, it takes more than hard braking and an expert at the wheel to do that. It takes a combination of balanced weight distribution, plus the way Chevrolet's front-end suspension is built into the chassis. There's the combination that makes for sure-footed, anti-dive braking control. Safer, easier, all-around handling with a car that'll stop heads up. Yes, safer by a long shot, even in a full reverse spin which we wouldn't wish on anybody driving on highways. But if it happens in an extreme emergency, Chevrolet's combination of outrigger rear springs and body balance are protection against a rollover. I don't expect you'll ever run into any road hazards like these, but here's another example of Chevrolet's ability to meet and beat an emergency. It's like balancing an egg on a toothpick. It takes more than driver juggling to do it. Balanced frame construction is what lets us ride this two-wheel tightrope. Oops. Think we'll make it? Well, take a look at the rugged steel backbone in that chassis. A rigid box girder frame with no excess weight and with a road holding low center of gravity makes it a cinch for us to come off these runs right side up. Just in case you're wondering what would happen if my boy didn't make it, I rigged this little stunt. Up and over. And these especially braced old jalopies we use in our shows really take a pounding. But it wouldn't prove a thing unless we put one of our regular cars in our fleet through this exact same routine. And this will really give you an idea of how rugged Chevrolet is. Because we run them brand new in this rollover demonstration. 
and this 1956 Chevrolet has no special reinforcement whatsoever. Here we go. Hold it. This is too good to miss. So let's start at the beginning again and run it real slow so you can see for yourself the full wallop this car takes on the rollover. As tough as any proving ground test a car can be put through. Durability, brother, that solid, sturdy, double wall steel construction really gives durability to Chevrolet. Because here we are, heads up and running. A car that can do that means the world to you in your everyday driving. And talking about everyday driving, I'm sure you won't get tied up in many situations like this. But to be freewheeling in tight spots where every inch counts is something we just don't take for granted. We've got to be sure of split-second response with every turn of the steering wheel. And no matter how or where you drive, when threading through traffic, cornering, taking the wide turns or the sharp turns on the highways, steering control is the key to easy, fatigue-free handling. You'll want that split-second response, and you'll get it from the same place we get it, from Chevrolet's ball race steering gear. It cuts friction and drag down to practically nothing. Besides, these outrigger rear springs mounted outside the frame members reduce sway and body roll on the sharpest of turns, producing sure fire control every foot of the way. Routines like this could be a tough, nerve-wracking grind, but behind the wheel of a Chevrolet, they're just the smooth, easy handling pleasure that's tops in our book, and can be the same for any driver who chooses Chevrolet. Now, no matter how good roads are these days, your car still takes plenty of bumps and jolts. But they're nothing compared to this ramp jump I'm going to show you for demonstration purposes. No sway, no swerve. Perfect balance and a perfect landing. It's a jarring test of the springs, chassis, and frame, and the pounding we give these same cars day after day proves beyond all doubt that they're built to take it under the roughest driving conditions. Of course, no one drives on such roads all the time, but the times that you do, it's good to know that the Chevrolet you drive can take this kind of punishment. I'm sure you won't be doing this kind of high flying, and no man would, even in this business, if he wasn't absolutely sold on the car he used. It takes power, the solid, dependable V8 power you've got at the tip of your toe when you press down on a Chevrolet accelerator. In case you missed some of that, we'll try it again. This is something we can do only on film, but it'll show you how steady Chevrolet is, even flying high like this. And in this demonstration, you'll see 1956 Chevrolet durability put to the acid test. A car has to have everything to do this and survive, especially durability. And considering that this same car was used for the rollover stunt, it's really rugged. Here's another chance to see what I mean. With Chevrolet, I know I can drive away under my own power every time. And I've got to know if I'm going to put on another show tomorrow. You can take my word, we live to drive, and drive to live, and Chevrolet is the car we trust our lives to. Day in, day out, night after night, we show off our driving skills with this package of driving thrills. But more than that, we prove every day that the extra margin of safety every family wants in a family car is built into a Chevrolet. Yes, this is the outfit, and here is the slogan they swear and live by. I drove all three. Comparison proves it's Chevrolet for me. It's a cinch this fellow knows, and you know too. You, you are about to know the thrill the of seeing Chevrolet. that which has never been seen before. You are about to enter a beautiful, exciting, wonderful new world. The world of 1960. 
for the first time in history, you'll see not one, not two, but three completely of Ford cars for 1960. A wonderful new world of Fords. First, representing the 1960 Fords, the finest Fords of a lifetime, the magnificent new Galaxy. There's a wondrous new life in the Fords of a lifetime. The finest new Fords of a lifetime in a beautiful, wonderful new world of Fords. Beautiful from any point of view, worth more from every point of value. The 1960 Fords open up a whole wonderful new world of styling elegance and built for people comfort. And now, the world's most wanted car. Thunderbird, the finest of fine cars, the last word in wish it were mine cars, the dream car of the wonderful new world of Fords. The 1960 Thunderbird. Finally, the car everyone's been waiting to see. The new size Ford, the Falcon. The Falcon, the new size Ford Falcon, you'll find that. The new size Ford Falcon's the easiest car in the wide world to own. Here's full comfort for six adults in a car that'll give you up to 30 miles a gallon. A new size car with a new size price. It's the easiest car in the world to own, the Ford Falcon. You can see these cars at your Ford dealer showroom now. The Falcon, the Thunderbird, and the 1960 Fords. There's a big, wide, wonderful world of new Fords, newly proportioned for you.
Take any home, your home. Set it aglow with the magic of music. Then watch as it opens a new world of fun and enjoyment for you and your family. It's RCA Victor's brilliant new best of 57 albums, including the artistry of... Frankie Carl in his building adventures in music around the world. Fabulous Lena Horn sings love songs in her Stormy Weather album. Fire of Belafonte as he sings of the Caribbean. Free and easy Perry Como in his special request album, We Get Letters. Look for Perry's bright RCA Victor display with the best of 57 albums in your choice of long play or the 45 economy package at your RCA Victor dealers now. You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams. And now C.H. Maslin and Sons bring you Act One of Red Dust, starring Lex Barker. Well, we're off again, on our way home. First men to reach Alpha Centauri. The first men to reach a solar system outside our own and live to tell it, except the two of us we left buried back there under that red dust. Look, Charlie, before you start crying about Kelly and Schwartz, remember we've got a long way to go before we reach Earth. So save your tears till then. You may need them for yourself. That's being very realistic. I'll bet the doc's so wrapped up over what we found down there that he wouldn't care if we ever got back. On the contrary, I'm very anxious to get back. Alpha Centauri had a remarkable civilization. Centuries in advance of ours, We'll benefit beyond measure from this accumulation of its knowledge we're bringing back. Makes us look like babes, huh? I'll never forget it. Those great, magnificent, shining cities. Yes, but no life. How weird. Completely deserted. Everything dead. Covered with that strange pink dust. They must have all died down there in some epidemic. And the dust just settled. Those papers you found there say anything about it, Doc? Well, I haven't had a chance to look through them fully yet. Say, where'd all this dust come from? Well, we must have picked some of it up before we left. I thought we cleaned up the ship thoroughly. We were so careful. Let's see. And it's that red dust from Alpha. It's all over the place. Boy, will I be glad to get back to Pittsburgh. Yes, it's the same dust that was covering planet A. Strange how consistent. there yesterday. I tell you, it's growing. Well, it sure is. Hey, no wonder I feel crawly. I feel it under my clothes. My yeah. skin. What's a little dust? We'll be going home soon. You're right, though. It is kind of crawly. It gets under your clothes. No wonder I've been itching. There's something alive about this dust. I don't like the way it grows. Well, forget about it. What we should have brought along is a housemaid. <laughs> a pretty one. Good thing we'll be getting back to Earth again in a few days before this dust gets any thicker. The rate it's been spreading, in another week we'd have to fight our way through it. Time for the shots again, Doctor. Good heavens. 
Was that the radiation shot? Sure. Have we all been getting them? Well, except Kelly and Schwartz, before we landed Alpha Centauri, they, they claimed they were allergic. They got reactions. They, they didn't think they needed them. That cost them their lives. What? But we checked before we landed. There was no radiation on Alpha. The radiation is there. On my finger. The dust? Dust. But I thought that they caught something that, that we didn't, that we were immune to somehow. Oh, it, it couldn't be the dust. Well, the ship's full of it. Our skin, our clothes. Then why did we survive? The radiation shots? Apparently. So far, it's no good. Frankly, now, when we signed up for this little thing, who would have thought that we'd make it there and back without a hitch? I don't think I even thought about it. Hey, Charlie. Can't you and the doc do something about this dust? I'm getting awful itchy. Time for the shots. Radiation shots again? Uh, that's more hogwash. What do we need them for? We're going home soon. What do we need them for, anyway? They just saved your life, that's all. They what? The doc just found out what killed Kelly and Schwartz. It was radiation disease. Caused by that pink dust. No, you're kidding. You mean this stuff? Hey, that's right. They didn't take their shots. It was a dust after all, and the reason we're alive is because of these shots. Ouch! <laughs> take it easy, Charlie. It's not my fault that Kelly and Schwartz didn't get their shots. Don't joke about it. Hey, Charlie, we're just as upset about this as you are, but there's nothing we can do about it now. Yeah, they knew when they came along what the chances were. Two men lost on an expedition like this, it's not so bad. Not when you consider that they didn't even survive, the first bunch didn't even survive the takeoff. What you've got to do, Charlie, is think about yourself. Concentrate on you. Yeah, you're just like the doctor. You don't care about anything but yourself. <laughs> no, you don't believe that. You wouldn't have worked for him so long. Oh, I respect him all right, but... I can't help thinking about Kelly out there on that, on that red desert. The dust swirling around him and, and us goggling down at him through the ports. And Kirk yelling, here's a toast to Kelly. And he came clumping back into the ship, his flight suit covered with it. And all the time that, that deadly dust was spreading over him, just like it's spreading over this ship, getting inside him, eating him away. Charlie, look, we all know that death is the price of knowledge. Yes, but none of you care anything about it. All Kurt here is interested in is excitement. And the doc will do anything for science, no matter who suffers. And you, Duncan. I suppose I just came along for the ride. What is it, Doc? You look worried. Here it is. As much as they knew about it, as much as I do. The dust? I know it's refractive index. It's my axial interference figure. And that's about all. <laughs> Thanks, that makes it as clear as a foggy night. It's a weird sort of radioactive life. A virus that attacks any living matter that comes near it. Radiation, huh? <laughs> well, then we're safe. No, I'm afraid not. Our shots just slowed it down. Slowed it down? You mean then... Just temporarily. But they can't stop it. And we've got it too, like Kelly and Schwartz. Have we, Doc? Have we? Yes. And once it gets going, there's no stopping it. They found that out on Alpha Centauri. These little specks are alive and deadly. Yeah, but Doc, if the shots slowed it down... The shots only take care of the radioactivity. But once that dust gets anywhere near you, its penetrating power is amazing. Tiny crystals settle in every cell of your body and begin to grow and radiate. Blocking off the radioactivity only seems to prevent quick death. It seems to have no effect at all on the growth of the crystals. And once they come anywhere near a vital organ... How long have we got? Uh, by attacking the radiation, slowing it down, perhaps 
10 or at best 15 years. 10 years? 10 years to die in? But we can't let that happen. You've got to do something. There's nothing I can do, Charlie. Not even for myself. But to die like that, waiting for it. Charlie, snap out of that it. That dust searing the life out of us. Charlie, it's just another medical problem for the doc and the boys at Science Center to figure out. They've got 10 years to do it in a breeze. They didn't come up with an answer in Alpha Centauri, did they? You're gonna die, Kurt. Big, brave, Kurt. You're just like all the rest of us. You try to prove all the time that you're better, but you're gonna die. Kurt, stop it. Can't you see he's hysterical? Well, he had it coming to him. Charlie, you're just tired. Get some rest. Got a grip on yourself. Well, that's the way it's gonna be. What this needs is a drink. Here. To the dust. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Ha <laughs> ha, red dust. You just can't resist showing off, can you, Kurt? Now don't you start, Doug. Mm. Not starting anything, but I'm not afraid to admit that I'm just plain scared. Well, the way I figure it is, we're 10, maybe 15 years ahead of what we expected to be when we started on this little excursion. And boy, I can do a lot with 15 years. Girl on every planet, huh? Well, let's face it, I'm, I'm 35 now, and in 15 years I'll be 50. Who wants to live any longer than that? 15 years and then... Maybe you're right. If they have that much time, our scientists ought to be able to find some way to stop it. Up out the airlock. Cool fellow. What do you know? I didn't think he meant it. Yes, he just couldn't live with the idea of death. You're both wrong. He said something before he. Do either of you realize what he meant? Well, he was off his beam. I knew that. He said what we were taking back to Earth was death. He was right. What? Listen. I know you're both tough enough to take this, so I won't sugarcoat the pill. We can't go back to Earth. We can't Say that go. again, Doc. I said we cannot return to Earth. <laughs> Watching Sleepcore, media for insomnia. вас еще привлекательнее, если среди множества оттенков вы найдете тот, который вам к лицу.
Эгидой Всемирной Ассоциации Мультипликационного Кино состоится очередной конгресс, посвященный празднованию тысячелетнего юбилея со дня создания первого мультипликационного фильма. Ожидается участие в конгрессе представителей свыше 600 планетарных и региональных отделений ассоциации. Делегации советских кинематографистов отбывает на празднование юбилея сегодня из центрального космопорта. Пульт Карат – это музыкальные акценты и яркие краски в звучании профессиональных и любительских эстрадных ансамблей. You're watching Sleep Core. Sleep tight. stages. There. Now you can launch it. Uncle Bill works with rockets. Jane, Bob, and Mike don't quite understand why rockets have to be fired in different stages. Uncle Bill explains that not all of them do.
just some of the big rockets that use liquid fuels. They need a vast amount of fuel to pull away from the Earth's gravity field. Rocket-propelled planes have been built designed to take a man up to very high altitudes. From the effect of gravity, the rocket plane is carried to high altitude by a large transport plane. If the cruiser were launched directly from the ground, much of its fuel would be used up in pulling away from the Earth's gravity field, which is strongest at the surface of the Earth. This makes the rocket plane the same in principle as the last stage of a multi-stage rocket. Both must be well away from the surface of the Earth before they are fired. 20 seconds to launch. 15 seconds. 10 seconds. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Before probing deeper into space, scientists have proposed another way of overcoming the problems of fuel and gravity. They propose space platforms, or way stations in space. Like the transport plane and the first stages of a multi-stage rocket, the way stations would provide a base from which a rocket may be launched. Various forms have been suggested, but a space station might look something like this. Such a space station might be built about 1,075 miles above the surface of the Earth. If it were farther out, it would be more difficult to send supplies. If it were closer, it would revolve around the Earth too quickly. It would, however, have to move fast enough to avoid being pulled down to the Earth by gravity. The Earth's gravity still pulls the station, of course, but the direction of the pull is changed by the satellite's forward motion. Instead of falling to the surface of the Earth, it keeps falling around the Earth. Station parts may be prefabricated on Earth, then delivered into orbit by transport rockets and assembled in space. Crewmen will arrive in the same orbit and travel at the same speed to carry out construction. The sections of the space station will be nearly weightless, and one man will be able to move objects that had to be lifted by huge cranes back on Earth. The men will be nearly weightless too, and will have small propulsion units attached to their spacesuits to help them move about. On the inside, the completed station would have to have its own artificial atmosphere. There would be very little pull of gravity to hold objects and people in place. To substitute for gravity, the station may be made to spin like a giant wheel. This would create centrifugal force and would give the occupants a feeling of gravity. They would be thrust outward toward the rim of the station. This would be down to them. Up would be toward the hub of the station. The way station may also be used for a research laboratory and for testing equipment for a journey farther into space.
Besides the problems of getting into space, we also have the problem of returning to the Earth from space. As a rocket approaches the Earth from space, it gathers speed. It also meets increased friction as the atmosphere becomes more dense closer to the Earth. Friction causes the rocket to become so hot that it burns up like a small meteor. Once we solve all these problems about space stations, Jane wonders why we couldn't put one on the moon. And we could. You might say that the moon is a ready-made way station in space. The moon is about 240,000 miles away, about as far as 10 trips around the Earth. To get 1,000 miles from the Earth, a rocket would need this much power. To get to the moon, a rocket would need just a little bit more. Landing on the moon will have its problems. The moon has little or no atmosphere, so friction and heat would not be a major problem. But the moon does have a gravity field, although it is not nearly as powerful as the gravity field of the Earth. A spaceship would approach the moon at high speed. Small rockets could be used to turn the base of the ship toward the moon. Other rockets would fire out of the base to slow down the spacecraft so that it could make a safe landing. The surface of the moon is quite different from that of the Earth. It is covered with large pits or craters. These may be places where large meteors collided with the moon in times past. In addition to craters, there are mountains, crevices, plains and plateaus. During the day, which on the moon is equal to about two Earth weeks, the temperature goes over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And during the long two-week night, it goes as low as about 250 degrees below zero. To escape the extreme temperatures, the moon station would probably be underground, where the temperature remains more moderate. It would need a source of power. Green plants might be used to produce oxygen within the station the station would have to be sealed to retain its artificial atmosphere. Probably the only parts of the station on the surface would be observation domes, entrance ports, and radio antenna. Taking off from a moon base, a space vehicle would not have to pass through a dense atmosphere. It would only have to pull away from the moon's comparatively weak gravity field. It could then head for Mars. At rocket speed, cruising through the very thin gas that appears to fill space, it would take many months to get to Mars. We would probably find some sort of atmosphere on Mars, but not an atmosphere like our own. If other planets, more like our own, exist, they are unknown planets of other suns far out in the universe. The star or sun nearest to our own is about 25 trillion miles away. It would take far more than a human lifetime to travel this distance at present rocket speeds. We have seen that one problem in reaching space is to escape from the Earth's gravity field. A great amount of energy is required to escape from this pull. Another important problem is re-entering the Earth's atmosphere at low enough speed so that friction is not too great. Too much friction causes too much heat. Man-made space stations in nearby space might go far toward overcoming the effect of gravity. Such stations would orbit the Earth like satellites and could serve as taking off points for more distant places. The moon might also serve as a way station. A rocket with enough power to pull away from the Earth would require only slightly more energy to carry it to the moon.
small rockets can be used to turn a spacecraft while it is in flight. Braking rockets may serve to slow it down enough to make safe approaches and landings possible. The moon might serve as a taking off point for other planets in our own solar system. A space vehicle could pull away from the moon's weak gravity field easily enough. From there, man could go on to the other planets. Mars is the one most like our own. Even so, it is doubtful that living things like those we know exist on Mars. If other planets more like our Earth exist, they must be planets of other suns that are trillions of miles away. There is so much we can learn in the universe. It is the frontier of the future. And way stations in space are the stepping stones for its exploration. slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter-silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace, where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent, lifting mind, I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space. Put out my hand and touch the face of God.
chance, the Wilsons and the Chandras meet and join up for sightseeing. Wilsons have never known anyone from the opposite side of the earth before. to see another show together. have picked up their children from the nursery. They go exploring a Belgian village. At dusk, a new fair comes to life.
You're watching Sleepcore. Pleasant dreams. Ja, das wünsche ich Ihnen auch, meine Damen und Herren, einen guten Abend und herzlich willkommen auf der Expo 85 der Weltausstellung für Technik und Wissenschaft. Wir sind in Japan, das haben Sie gemerkt, und wir wollen von hier einen Blick in unsere Zukunft tun, das Leben zum Beispiel im Jahre 2001 betrachten. Wie wird die Technik aussehen? Wie wird die Mode aussehen und wie die Mode aussehen wird, dafür haben wir hier ein Beispiel. Sie sehen die sehr exotischen Uniformen der jungen Damen. Nun tröstlich ist, dass selbst wenn wir hier ein futuristisches Äußeres haben, die alten Traditionen doch im Inneren noch zu finden sind. Das merkt man am besten daran, wenn man auf Japanisch sich begrüßt. Ich versuche das mal. Viel tiefere Veränderungen werden Roboter in unser Leben bringen. Hier haben wir ein Beispiel davon, ein Roboter, der etwas schön gestaltet ist, das heißt also nicht die Automaten, die wir sonst immer kennen. Dieser Roboter reagiert auf Sprache und spricht auch. Und die Frage ist, welche Dinge werden wirklich unser Leben bis zum Jahre 2001 beeinflussen? Wir wollen Ihnen mal hier in diesem Disneyland der Technik einige Eindrücke geben. Technik auf Japanisch, dafür einige Beispiele. Roboter gibt es zu bewundern. Gigantische Dimensionen. Das Publikum hält respektvoll Abstand. Selbst für die an technische Spielereien gewöhnten Japaner ist dieser fünf Meter hohe Roboter faszinierend. Und von diesen Spielzeugen gibt es noch mehr auf der Expo 85. Das ist es, das Wunderland der Technik von oben gesehen. Architektonische Besonderheiten, vielleicht ein Ausblick auf die Städte von morgen. Die Menschen mit den ungewöhnlichen Stilelementen zurechtkommen, ist schwer vorherzusagen. Die Besucher jedenfalls bewegen sich wie in einem Freizeitpark, scheinbar ohne lange über die zukünftigen Entwicklungen nachzudenken. Zu so stark bestimmen auch die Traditionen das Leben in Japan. Eine für Europäer oft unverständliche Mischung aus langsam gewachsenen Verhaltensweisen, an denen festgehalten wird, und allzu raschem Akzeptieren auch des skurrilsten Auswüchse der modernen Zivilisation. Den aus entfernten Regionen angereisten Japanern ist sicher die Begrüßung vertraut. Die Uniformen der Mädchen sind es weniger. Übrigens eine anstrengende Arbeit, bei den erwarteten Millionen von Besuchern. In den Ausstellungshallen gibt es Technik zu sehen. Der versprochene Blick in die Zukunft wird hier von der Autoindustrie gestaltet. Superstädte im Modell sollen den Besucher beeindrucken. Selbstverständlich darf das Auto in diesem Konzept nicht fehlen. Dazu die entsprechenden Parktürme in der Zukunft statt. Straßenschleifen übereinander geschichtet und selbstverständlich ein ständig fließender Verkehr.
Die Realität jedoch sieht schon heute anders aus. Will man zur Weltausstellung mit dem Auto fahren, sind leicht vier Stunden für 40 Kilometer einzukalkulieren. Das hier ist eine ganz normale Verkehrssituation in Tokio. Allein die U-Bahn verspricht schnelleres Fortkommen. Gezeigt werden auch schnittige Automodelle. Und wer hat sie nicht gehabt, die Bilderbuchträume von einer Welt, die leider so nicht existiert. In der Zukunft sollen die Autos mit Bildschirmen ausgerüstet werden. Man kann während der Fahrt zu Hause anrufen und die Familie über Fernsehtelefon begrüßen. Vielleicht ein guter Zeitvertreib im Verkehrsstau. Realistischer erscheint diese Vision der Zukunft. Zwar sitzt der Japaner normalerweise längst nicht so komfortabel in der überfüllten U-Bahn, aber dieser Versuchszug auf der Weltausstellung zeigt ein Verkehrssystem, an dem in verschiedenen Teilen der Welt gearbeitet wird, die Schwebebahn. Ohne Räder, auf Magnetfeldern schwebend, gleitet sie hier sehr langsam über magere 370 Meter Schiene. Als ob demonstriert werden müsste, mit welcher Geschwindigkeit die Forschungsarbeiten auf diesem Gebiet vorangehen. Menschen eins werden lassen mit der Technik ist ja ein Motto dieser Ausstellung. Ob das mit diesen Spielereien gelingt, bleibt offen. Robotern menschliche Eigenschaften zu geben, scheint das Konzept in vielen Hallen zu sein, um Technik dem Publikum näher zu bringen. zum Kitsch ist dabei nicht zu vermeiden. Eine Liebesgeschichte zwischen Robotern. Etwas fürs Herz, auch wenn es noch so abwegig ist. Roboter findet Roboter, wenn er richtig programmiert ist. Und nach der Fantasie dieses Show-Autors soll es irgendwann einmal so richtig innig zwischen Menschen und Robotern werden. Mit gemischten Gefühlen sozusagen. You're watching Sleepcore, Media for Insomnia.
For thousands of years, man looked up into the night sky and pondered the mysteries so far beyond his solving. Now, abruptly, he has found ways to bridge the gap between this earth and other worlds. For man, a new era has been born, the age of space. What will life be like in this new age? Century 21 tries to answer that question by constructing a vivid realistic projection of man's world tomorrow in five main areas of his environment. First, the world of century 21. How and where man will live, work and play in the next century. And the world of commerce and industry, the machines, materials, methods and products of tomorrow. Next, the world of visual art. The line and shape and color of man's creative activities in a world of vastly increased leisure time. Then there's the world of science, a fascinating panorama of tools and techniques that man will use to probe deeper into space and into the mysteries of life itself. And finally, the world of entertainment. Music, dance, drama, sports, and of course, a futuristic gateway designed for sheer fun in any century. These are the five worlds of the Century 21 Exposition. Under Exposition President Joe Gandhi, Century 21 audaciously bid for approval in Paris by the Bureau of International Expositions. To get it would mean that no one of the 30 European member nations could officially exhibit anywhere except at Century 21 for the next 10 years. Visitors moving from one world of Century 21 to another will walk the boulevards of the world, a pattern of streets and avenues lined with colorful shops, bazaars, bars, and restaurants. Century 21 did get it, thanks in a big way to being able to produce no strike pledges for the exposition period by Seattle Area Labor Unions. Just east of this work and extending north toward Mercer Street is the central mall of the exhibition grounds. Along this mall, to be lined with trees, one feature will be an international water sculpture display like nothing ever seen before. Across the way, the armory is being transformed into a food circus pavilion to feed and entertain the hungry multitudes. The exposition central boulevard extends from Mercer Street along this side of the armory and on south to a scenic knoll and the five-unit U.S. Science Pavilion. Another of the five worlds of Century 21, the world of science. Near here will be erected those buildings that will showcase the tomorrow look of U.S. industry. Moving then back to the north again, we come to the spot where workmen are now busy driving piling. This is construction for footings for what will be an exhibition hall, and to the west of that, a new playhouse. And farther east, the old ice arena is also due for modernization. And the parking lot on the corner of 5th and Mercer becomes part of the Gayway 21 amusement strip. Then moving south again, we pass the stadium, which will be integrated into the exposition grounds and used for Century 21 events. And from there, on to the monorail terminal and to the Space Needle with its tower restaurant. You're watching Sleepcore. Sleep tight.
67, Montreal, Canada, April 28th to October 27th, 1967. soon, the magnificent beauty and splendor of Treasure Island must become a thing of pleasant memory. Gone will be the magic pattern of the great World Fair of the West. Gone the brilliant spectacle of five million California flowers woven into a fabric of wondrous exhibits and spectacular shows. The spirit of the Golden Gate International Exposition is symbolic of the bridges that span San Francisco's bay. First, the Golden Gate Bridge, longest and highest single-span suspension bridge in the world. Then the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge, eight and a quarter miles of double span, which brings the metropolis of the West into speedy contact with Treasure Island and the widespread East Bay Empire. The architectural design of the entire exposition embodies building motifs from both the eastern and western shores of the Pacific, creating an atmosphere of the peace and industrial security that belongs to us, the people of the Western Hemisphere. The states of the West tell us about themselves, and Uncle Sam, with an exhibit covering seven and a half acres, dynamically portrays America at work and at play. The Federal Building is one of the shows you should not miss. Foreign pavilions, colorful and exciting, show us the ways of life in faraway lands. Knowledge, leisure, travel and recreation are yours at the pageant of the Pacific. There's entertainment for all. America, Cavalcade of a Nation, Billy Rose's Aquacade, the Folie Bergere, Salici's Puppets, to name just a few of the attractions. The Palace of Fine Arts presents a $30 million exhibit, the most comprehensive showing ever brought together of old and modern masters. For the first time, you can see artists backstage, painters, sculptors, potters, and weavers revealing the secrets of their crafts. Science shows you the marvels of black light, cold heat, and atom smashing. Industry brings you the richness of modern America. Travel exhibits take you round the world in an hour, and you'll have fun doing it. But night comes to Treasure Island. Gay, carefree evenings filled with enchanting memories that will remain with you for all time. The nightly pageant of light is almost unreal in its loveliness. Ever-changing colorings give an Arabian night's magic to the entire exquisite picture. You will want to see the Golden Gate International Exposition again and again in the short time left to you. Plan your visits now and plan to see it all. Too soon, it will be too late. Remember, Treasure Island, the World Fair of the West, closes forever on September 29th. <laughs>